Good Wednesday afternoon. Jerry Miller, welcome to the I Love Seville show. It's good to be with you guys. Thank you kindly for joining us. We're live in Charlottesville, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world on the I Love Seville network. Really good program lined up for you. If you care about Charlottesville, if you care about Central Virginia, the I Love Seville show is tailor-made for you. We have Dr. Richardson, our city manager, being reviewed in multiple closed-door meetings by city council. He's only one year on the job and the chief executive officer of the city of Charlottesville might be um, on thin ice or might be on some fire here. So we're going to talk about that story. How about Rory Stolzenberg, our city manager? Did you see the story in the Daily Progress? Above the fold, lead story, um, planning commissioner Rory Stolzenberg goes out for a walk this weekend to get some Bodo's bagels. Who doesn't love some Bodo's bagels? The man's hungry. He goes out for some Bodo's bagels, um, and in, in the process of walking, he sees dozens and dozens of Virginia State troopers clad in Virginia State uniform garb getting into public um, utility and city maintenance vehicles and driving them around, and before they drove them around and left the city yard, they covered the Public Works logo, the city maintenance logo, with uh, a decal that said Charlottesville Police. So basically, state troopers on Saturday were driving around in unmarked vehicles that look like they're for improving the roads or driving trash or maintaining the city, and they put a decal over those and say, we're now police. And they go to monitor the protests over the weekend. We'll have that story for you. The really curious aspect of that story is how the police chief responded to the story. That's the most curious aspect of the story. A lot of news today, including the big greasy breakfast being destroyed and dismantled by Charlottesville Radio Group and Saga Communications. The trend continues of local media, Siva Weekly, NBC 29, The Daily Progress, Charlottesville Radio Group, of letting staff go. Welcome to the I Love Seville Show. We are an advertising agency, and we're so grateful that you're joining us. Two of our favorites of 112 of this morning clients that we love working alongside, Interstate Pest and Service Companies, and Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine. Interstate, a four-generation strong business, really making an impact in this community, guys. Interstate Pests and Service Companies. From 1969 to 2020, lucky to have Interstate in this community. Same with the good Dr. Scott Wagner. Chiropractic care, physical therapy, sports medicine. Dr. Wagner has your back. Judah Wickhauer is our director. Rory Stolzenberg in 15 minutes. Let's go to Rory and let's get that Daily Progress story on. Do you have the story um, from the Daily Progress, the headline, Judah? This is on the photos. Um, in fact, you know what? Just go straight to the photos. Um, the which one comment concerned me right there for me. Let's go to Rory's photos. So Rory, who is going to join us on screen, and I want first the close-up, if you could put on screen, for the Virginia State Trooper in the vehicle. And tell me when that's on screen. Please, give me a thumbs up. All right, so that's on screen. Everybody look at the screen now. These are Rory Stolzenberg's photos, as seen in the Daily Progress today. So... I'll give you a little background and a little nitty-gritty, and then you'll hear from the source himself, the photographer extraordinaire, Planning Commissioner Rory Stolzenberg. Dude is walking over the weekend because he's hungry, and dude wants to go to Bado's, Bodo's Bagels, Rory does, because he's hungry. And in the process of going to Bodo's Bagels, maybe it's a sausage, egg, and cheese. Maybe Rory's a bacon, egg, and cheese. Maybe Rory wants some lox on there. Maybe Rory wants a Caesar salad along with that bacon, egg, and cheese. Maybe it's an everything bagel, a plain bagel. So he's hungry. He sees buses, and on these buses are state troopers. If I saw buses and state troopers were getting off buses, I would say... What are those guys doing? Those are state troopers. Then he sees state troopers getting into vehicles that are owned by the city. If the next thing I saw after witnessing dozens of state troopers get off buses, if I then witness these guys get into city vehicles, I'm going to look a little bit closer and probably pull out my camera as, my camera as well. 
Next thing you know, these city vehicles, you look a little closer, and they have decals on them that cover the city vehicle monogram or, or logo, and it's basically a decal that says, this is now Charlottesville Police. Okay? So this is a very weird situation. Questions immediately come to my mind. Here's some of them. Why are state troopers using city trucks to monitor a protest instead of using state trooper vehicles? I, it, I think that's fair. Why are state troopers using city pickup trucks instead of using state trooper vehicles to monitor protests? Okay, second question I have, right? Here's a second one I have. When Rory presented this to Charlottesville City Council in its last meeting, when the police chief and the city manager were on the call, the police chief's response, very strange. And I'm going to re read it verbatim from the Daily Progress so I don't mess this up. Police Chief Brackney says, quote, I, do not, I, don't, I don't have any knowledge of any state troopers driving city cars. They didn't have our vehicles, and they don't have our vehicles. End quote. All right, guys, I'm, I'm scratching my head right here, and I'm just trying to, like, just be a dude that lives in Charlottesville, Virginia, and just, like, wants to live in a city that's treats people fairly and has accountability and transparency, and people understand what's expected of them. When people understand what's expected of them and what lane they're supposed to be in, and when people understand, you know, this is how I'm supposed, this is how I'm, I'm supposed to be accountable to myself, then the community responds better. So when the police chief says, I have zero knowledge, I have zero knowledge of state troopers driving city cars, they didn't have our vehicles and they don't have our vehicles. Guys, I, you know, I'm not trying to jump to conclusions, but that worries me a little bit because you either have the chief executive officer of the police department and the police chief not knowing that state, state troopers are using the, the, the pickup trucks that belong to the city. Okay, so maybe she really doesn't know or maybe she did know, did not know how to manage the question in real time from Rory, and that's how she responded. I guess basically that's called lying. <laughs> um, or even worse, this has been happening for a while. Okay, what is, what is worse on the spectrum? Is worse on the spectrum option A, Police chief literally did not know that state troopers were using city pickup trucks to monitor peaceful protests this past weekend in Charlottesville. Option A, I'm presenting to the jury, option A, the police chief did not know, literally did not know. Option B, it's an optics issue. When questioned in a live setting in front of council and city manager, the police chief felt uncertain with how to respond, and unfortunately, option B, she lied because she wasn't sure the optics piece and the strategy behind managing this question. Okay, so that's the second one. Option C, maybe this has been happening for a really long time. <laughs> are, we, are we supposed to just think, because we're, I mean, I'm a smart, we're, we're smart people here. Did it just happen this one protest? Was this the only time it happened? <laughs> or was this the only time an astute observer named Rory Solzerberg caught it with his camera? Uh, I, the story became a story because of the police chief's response. If the police chief had straight up said, yes, Virginia State Troopers, Mr. Stolzenberg, were in unmarked city trucks to monitor the protest, this is how the fallout would have happened. We would have, for about a hot second, a New York minute, for about a cup of coffee, we would have been like, what? The police is using pickup trucks that pick up trash and make sure our roads are up to speed? That ain't right. Police shouldn't be using unmarked trucks. We should know who the police are, especially monitoring 
peaceful protests. Okay, if she had said, yes, that's what we're doing, for about a New York minute, we would have had issue with that and we would have forgotten it. But because she said, I have no knowledge of this, this was not the case, it made it a freaking story. And this, once again, folks that follow this show, and we're live on 12 freaking Facebook pages, I see four different states watching, and folks across the Commonwealth tuning in, folks, once again, this shows the value of managing perception and managing optics and branding strategy. Rory Stolzenberg in eight, nine minutes to talk about this. Now, I want to I wanna stay on kind of counsel for a second before I go to our story of the big Reese breakfast on 3WV being absolutely dismantled, destroyed, demoralized, and depressed, and how this is undoubtedly a trend that's impacting local media. I got that story for you. Before I do, another story, a topic that you need to consider. Our city manager right now is under some heat multiple closed door sessions with counselors reviewing the job performance of Dr. Richardson, the highest paid city employee who's making two bills plus, ladies and gentlemen, 200 plus, probably total compensation at two and a quarter, 225, 225,000. The dude comes from Texas, well-credentialed, Mayor Walker goes to the bat and really pushes hard for Dr. Richardson's hiring. The guy comes immediately to Charlottesville, and from my vantage point, and I follow it, and, and, and we got friends over at City Hall, the, man, the man's proven to be rather difficult to work with. Your police chief, your, excuse me, your fire chief, and fire chief Baxter resigns when he's at the pinnacle of his profession in Charlottesville, you got rumblings, rumblings and grumblings of, uh, of uh, an authoritarian nature, my way or the highway, uh, leadership tactic and strategy. In the my way or the highway, local government in Charlottesville, my way or the highway does not work in local government in Charlottesville, Virginia. We'll follow that story closely. Let's go to our next headline, though, Judah Wickhauer. Um, how about the Big Greasy Breakfast? So I've been in Charlottesville for 20 years. One of the best morning local shows, morning talk shows in Charlottesville, guys, the Big Greasy Breakfast on 3WV. Now, I'm going to, my, my background out of the University of Virginia was print, radio, and television. I was the youngest editor in the history of the Daily Progress had a radio talk show called The Jerry Miller Show that was syndicated on 12 affiliates across three states. And then two TV shows with NBC29 that bear my name on Saturday and Sunday for 30 minutes. Traditional media is like, I know traditional media like the Pope knows holy water. Okay? And there's three radio stations that are the major players in the Charlottesville and Central Virginia market. Do you guys know what the three local radio stations that are the major players in this market are? I'll give you a minute to think. Think to yourself. Ask yourself. I'll give you about five seconds. What are the three major radio, radio stations? Okay. So I have the answer. This is by listenership and this is by reach. The three major radio stations in the city of Charlottesville, guys, are 3WV, Country 99.7 WCYK. The first one is 97.5 3WV. The second one is Country 99.7 WCYK. And the third one is Hot 101.9. So two of those three are owned by Monticello Media and George Reed. Monticello Media is the station off Pepsi Place on Route 29. I used to work there at Monticello Media. Okay, So they have Hot 101.9 and Country 99.7. Charlottesville Radio Group on Rose Hill Drive, their two main stations are 3WV 97.5 and Z95. Z95 we hear in a lot of the medical offices or the retail shops. It's just easy listening, not in your face, nice to have in the background. Okay, their major, their major brand in their portfolio, Charlottesville Radio Group, is 97.53 WV. Their go-to programming on their major brand in their portfolio, 
the best station they got, 97.5, their go-to programming, the big greasy breakfast in the morning with Max and Highway John. I've been in Charlottesville 20 years. The Big Greasy Breakfast is as good of local radio as you are going to find in this market. It's entertaining. It's engaging. It's edgy. It's kind of on the cusp of, ooh, do I want my kid to hear that? But at the same time, you're chuckling inside. It's that jolt of energy you need in the morning as you're going to work. It's a good show. Charlottesville Radio Group that's owned by Saga Communications has now demoralized dismantled, depressed, and downright destroyed the Big Greasy Breakfast. It is no more. Charlottesville Radio Group has let Max go, so Max no longer works for that station. Highway John has been moved to the afternoons. And you know what the really crappy part about this is? You know what the Big Greasy Breakfast has been replaced with? And do you have that headline on screen, Judah? Put it back up if you could. It's been replaced by a syndicated talk show. A syndicated talk show with no ties to the Charlottesville or Central Virginia market. So that's a springboard into the macro story I'm about to cover. In the last 30 to 45 days, here is what we've seen from Charlottesville Radio Group, the Seville Weekly, the Daily Progress, and NBC 29. First, the Sevo Weekly, headlight on screen, Judah Wickhauer. Look at the screen, look at the screen, look at the screen. Blair Kelly and Bill Chapman have laid off a third of their staff at the Sevo Weekly due to uh, declining ad revenues, due to a print deterioration, and due to an overall lack or an overall decline of market share in advertising in Charlottesville and Central Virginia. Those are facts. You can't argue with that. They cut a third of their staff. They're going to replace them with rookie reporters at 35% of the price, save 35% in payroll, and hope to pivot their model. I think the print days of the Sevo Weekly are numbered. Let's go to the sister. Let's go to their competitor in the market, the Daily Progress. The Daily Progress. Do you have the headline on screen of the Daily Progress and furloughs, Judah? That's on screen. Look at the screen. Look at the screen. Look at the screen. The Daily Progress. Massive furloughs across its newsroom. Guess what, guys? I used to work out of the Daily Progress. First job out of college was at the Daily Progress under Jerry Hooty Ratcliffe. I finished my tenure at the Daily Progress as the youngest editor in the history of the newspaper. I was freaking overworked, undervalued, underappreciated, and incredibly underpaid. And eventually I said, to hell with this. I know my value, and it's not working for peanuts in this newsroom. And the Daily Progress shows it's owned by Lee Enterprise now. Lee Enterprises has no care about Charlottesville whatsoever. The parent company of the Daily Progress, all they care about, you know what all they care about is? Money. Money. Daily Progress, massive furloughs. How about NBC 29, the old stalwart? Guess what, guys? I used to work for NBC 29, worked there for five years, worked for the Daily Progress, worked for NBC 29, worked for Monticello Media, know these businesses inside and out, literally was trained from a sales standpoint, from a strategy standpoint, from an auditing standpoint, and an on-air creation standpoint by these companies. NBC 29 lays off one time of my boss, amicably part ways Jay Yergo. Scott Hamler, the creative director at NBC 29, no longer there. Henry Graff moves to Richmond. Promotion, props to Henry. But we see NBC 29, who has new ownership, also impacting, also having issues with their business model, just like the progress in Sevo Weekly. Why do I bring this up? Why do I bring this up? I bring this up because the value of local news is more important than ever. We have a need for transparency with our police department more than ever. We have a council that is leading Charlottesville with apparently no focus on the business community whatsoever, at least not what I can find. We have a fiscal 2021 budget that's in shambles. And we don't know where the money's going to go to keep teachers in the classrooms to teach your kids and my kids. 
We have a city manager who's trying to rule as if he's iron-fisted my way or the highway as opposed to leveraging his most valuable resources, his personnel, and the intellect they possess. Local journalism is at a crossroads of epic proportions, and the future is bleak. It's bleak. Very bleak. I got so much more content and so many more storylines for you. But I have a guy that I want to go to here in Rory Stolzenberg. Um, Rory, I'm going to try Skyping you. I hope we get him in here. We've had a little connection issues, but this guy's good. It's ringing, Judah. Rory Stolzenberg. I'm giving you a heads up. I hope we have this guy. He's super bright. Ooh, he's got a great looking beard right now. Um, Judah, can I get a thumbs up if we can get him on screen? Can you hear me, Rory? I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? Oh, I can hear Rory. Can you hear him, Judah? Can you hear him, Judah? We can hear you, Rory. We can hear you. All right, so Rory, um, I just want to get out of your way. Um, this weekend, you're walking to Bodo's. You're hungry. You're excited to get the, some carbs in your belly and to start the day. And on the process of Bodo's, you see what? The show's yours. Talk as, talk as long as you want. Yeah, absolutely. So I was just heading up to Bodo's, um, and I will say I had heard a rumor uh, that they had evacuated the city yard of, of city vehicles uh, in preparation for some sort of planning around, uh, you know, Saturday's uh, demonstration. Um, so I personally thought that the rumors were almost certainly not true. Uh, so on my way to Bodo's, I, I'm passing the city yard anyway. Uh, so, you know, I snap a picture of what's going on there, which looks like basically nothing. Um, I go and post on Twitter, yeah, no, this rumor is debunked, it's perfectly normal and fine. Uh, so, you know, I go get uh, my bagels, an inordinate amount of bagels probably. Um, and uh, as I'm walking back, uh, so I cross pressed in, I'm right at that corner uh, where Wendy's is, um, and I get passed by this convoy of uh, a... Uh, Virginia State Police squad SUV leading two uh, pickup trucks, Ford F-350s, heavy-duty pickups, um, that have city markings. And uh, so it's like the, the city shield on the door, and then it's a decal of Charlottesville police right under them. Um, and all three vehicles were being driven by state troopers. Uh, so I was like, that's it's a little weird. It's a little sketchy. Uh, I'll take some pictures of that. Um Kind of, I mean, I post them online, I go home and I go eat my bagels. Uh, and, uh, you know, to be clear, I, I tagged the city police to ask them for a comment. Um, you know, surrounding all those rumors, you know how rumors go, there's speculation that like a bunch of Nazis might be coming in town to counter protest, that there might be some sort of conflict related to that. It seemed like maybe the public should be informed. Um, didn't get a response back from them. Uh, and uh, that was sort of that. Um, a couple hours later, so that was around 2 p.m., um, at about 5 p.m., um, I'm, uh, dog sitting my friend's dog for less than 24 hours on Saturday and Sunday, and, uh, I take him for a walk. Um, so, you know, we're kind of just, we're starting from the mall, we're going around, figure I stop by the city yard and see what's going on there now. Um, and as it happened, uh, just as I was there around 515, uh, a... Another uh, state trooper SUV pulls up, and he's followed by three coach buses full of state troopers uh, pulling in. And then there's another, like, four or five squad cars uh, pulling in behind them. Um, so I'm like, that's, again, uh, pretty weird. Um, so, you know, take a picture, post it online, whatever. I uh, got some pictures of the cute dog in there. Uh, he is an adorable beast. <laughs> Um, but, uh, that was pretty much, again, I thought that, um, you know, uh, later I was up at the block party, um, at Barracks Emmett, um, and, uh, you know, it didn't seem from there, like the, the state troopers were being deployed or anything. Um, and I, I have to give, uh, the Charlottesville police credit that like during these last three protests, uh, they very much changed their attitude from yes. in years past where, you know, remember 2018, uh, the anniversary, and uh, they completely surround downtown twice over with fencing. Uh, you know, there's armed, multiple armed police officers at every single possible entrance to anywhere downtown. 
and I'm literally walking around with my papers in my pocket uh, so that I can get to my house. Um, a utility bill, I guess, is what they actually required. Uh, but uh, so um, they kind of have changed their attitude recently, um, and they're showing up with public works dump trucks to block off traffic, and then you know a few bike cop type type of things to uh, redirect traffic around, um, which is you know probably how they should be handling people's expressions of their First Amendment rights and demonstrations. Um, so, you know, in contrast to, to that from the previous couple of demonstrations, um, this, this idea that, you know, several or dozens and dozens, maybe over a hundred state troopers are coming in and suiting up in riot gear, uh, there's a little bit of a tension there for sure. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, the state police also had a uh, plane flying overhead, circling over town. I think anyone who lives in the Greenbrier or Meadows or kind of UVA area, like North Grounds, I'm sure noticed it. Um, just circling at 3,000 feet uh, overhead for several hours. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm a plane nerd, so uh, I'm, you know, on my phone on Flight Radar 24 and watching its flight path and looking at its registration number, which happens to be... Um, N35 Victor Alpha, uh, which is one digit off from the helicopter that was surveilling us on August 12th. Man. Uh, the one that didn't crash. There were two. Uh, the, the one that crashed was 3-1 VA. Um, <laughs> Why do you know that? Why do you still know that? Rory Stolzimer. Let me jump in here. This guy, this guy, his knowledge is off the charts here. Let me, let me, let me ask some, uh, let me, let me get it more uh, directed here. So yeah. I, I, I think... I, I saw what you posted on Twitter. Mm -hmm. You tag the police department. So you mm -hmm. notify them in advance that you had this photos so they could plan an optics strategy for how to handle it should the photos come to light. So you essentially gave them a few days of runway to plan a strategy. Then mm -hmm. you go into the Zoom meeting with council, city manager, and the police chief and you ask about this. Where the story became so weird is the police chief's response because that made it a story. Before, they could yeah. have just chalked it up as saying, yeah, state troopers are in city vehicles. We should have let you guys know, but we wanted to have backup presence, and we wanted them to use this because we, we were concerned that the state trooper vehicles may upset people, so we're going to put them in, and trucks like this not to upset people will manage perception. But when she said she did not know this, that made it a story. I'll get out of your way on that yeah no i think that's exactly right um you know she she could have just said yes state troopers were brought into town in the joint command they were ordered to hold back uh because we didn't want them to disrupt the protest but they were there just in case anything went wrong or nazis showed up or whatever um but we made sure that they stayed home and didn't get used um of course later uh well so a uva surgeon spotted them in the backs of those pickup trucks in riot gear uh, riding towards JPJ, um, and on Tuesday I got a picture sent to me of uh, actually them dressed in riot gear in the back of those trucks right at Arlington and Millmont, uh, so driving along Barracks Road Shopping Center uh, directly towards and next to the protest, right, which was at the northeast corner of Barracks Road. Um, so yeah, uh, it was pretty pretty baffling to me, um, and, and that was the really shocking thing that uh, the Police chief, uh, when you know asked to explain the state troopers' presence in town and and their use of city vehicles, just flat out denied that it ever happened. But could she? Could she? Could she legitimately not know? Or is that just ridiculous to believe that she may not know this? Yeah. So I mean, to me, there's there's three possible options for what happened, right? Um, because obviously there's incontrovertible proof that it happened. Right. Um, and uh, you know, there we know there are city vehicles. Uh, it looks like now, so yesterday, w one of them with the same vehicle number was spotted next to the police station downtown, um, but it didn't have CPD markings anymore. It was now facilities management. So they took the magnet of CPD off. Um, so we know that the police must have cleared giving them the vehicle and putting the decals on it. Uh, the civilian side must have cleared uh, giving the vehicle to the police to give to VSP. Um, so like we know what happened. Um, and so there's one of three options I think for, for why the chief responded the way she did. Um, 
You know, and the first is maybe an honest mistake. Uh, you're in these public comment sessions. You get put on the spot. Yeah. And uh, you're trying to come up with an answer. I mean, they probably should have seen that one coming because I Because you tagged, tagged them. Yeah, I tagged them. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know. Um, number two, I guess, is that it was just an outright lie for reasons I can't quite like think of. Um, I, I just don't know why. Uh, maybe it's just instinct for the police. I don't know. Um, I would like to believe that that's not the option. I would like to believe um, that's not the case, too. I want to believe that, too. The third option is almost the scariest of all, Is it's, right? it's happening all along. It's been happening the whole time. Yeah, but, I mean, so the third option is that she was telling the truth as she knew it, that she actually didn't know that there were dozens of state troopers in town, which she denied, that they were driving city vehicles, even though they were given to them by her department, there was a there was a CPD CSO working the gate of the city yard all day long, uh, you know, letting them in. Um, and so, is it possible that they could have that the state could have brought in riot cops and requisitioned our vehicles and only ever worked with these lower level officers? And the chief had no idea any of this was happening, even though there was a formal joint command set up between. The city, the county, UVA, and the state. Um, that's horrifying. That is horrifying. That's horrifying if that's the case. Absolutely horrifying. Um, it's even worse than a straight-up lie. It's, it's, that is worse than straight-up lying. That's mm -hmm. straight-up insubordination backdooring uh, your boss. Um, that is, that's, that's horrifying. All right, so here's, here, let me throw this to you here. Um, they have to respond to this. Don't you think they ha they have? To? I mean, they can't. They got to respond to this, don't you think? Yeah. So um, on Monday night, council. So like the the way council played out, right? There's a public comment in the beginning where I you know referenced it. It's audio only, uh, and then the chief flat out denied it. Um, and then there's like five hours later at the end of the meeting, there's another session. So as soon as she denied it, I'm like, what? Oh, like God. these pictures? I um, know. So, so I sent him an email with all the pictures and like look um and by the end of the public comment uh i spoke again the chief had left by that point but council demanded an answer by tuesday um which last i checked and it's hard to keep track of the days it was I know, yesterday tuesday is yesterday yeah. yeah um they apparently were not given any information um so uh so you got to imagine they've got to say something eventually they got uh, to it's like they're just going to dig themselves into a deeper hole the longer they pretend this isn't happening. Amen. But He's exactly right. The longer this does not get addressed, and I, Brian Wheeler is a smart man, I assure you that he is offering this perspective. The longer this does not get addressed, the more this becomes an issue that we need to worry about. Um, how about you, you personally, you're, you're going to get some bagels, you take some photos, and you have an above the fold A1 story based on photos that you, can you imagine if your memory, if iCloud was full that day? Yeah, I know. Actually, uh, it's funny. My on my phone, uh, the camera is just like straight up broken. Um, let's see if I can get an image of that there. Uh, so I actually had to. There was like a bunch of shattered glass that made all of my pictures up until five days ago basically unusable. Um, so in the pictures I took, uh, you know, shrunk down. It's pretty visible. There's city trucks or whatever. You can't totally see that the state trooper is driving it. Um, as it happens in the full res, you can pretty easily tell it. Uh, well, hold on one second. I think I think Judah Judah's got it. Judah, can you put it on screen with the Virginia State Trooper in there? He's got it on screen right now, of talking to us. Um, awesome. It's yeah. So uh, like I, I just happened to strip all that shattered glass off my phone last week, um, and and none of these pictures would have even worked if I hadn't done that. Uh, so that's. You know, nice to have, I guess. The crazy thing is, and, and, and I think we should follow the story. Here's the crazy thing. is If, if heads roll because of this, that is, that is going to be a crazy story to follow. We'll follow this here. You had, when we were, when we were um, getting ready for the show, and I didn't have time to follow back through, you mentioned um, something about Dewberry. Mm, yeah. I want, show is yours. Yeah, uh, so as you know, um, I work at Lumen. Uh, we build a smart electrical panel. Uh, but more importantly for this, uh, we are in the building where Citizen Burger is. 
uh, kind of in the back, uh, so right next to CVS on Water Street. Uh, so we, uh, I think I've showed you before, I have the greatest view from my window of the Dewberry in this entire town. Um, like, just directly out there, it's the Dewberry. Um, so the other day, uh, what, probably a week or two ago at this point, um, I noticed that there were a whole bunch of uh, construction workers up in there. Uh, they had a truck going uh, on that, that little plaza on Water Street. Uh, they have a, a generator going and a wire just kind of hold up six stories up. Um, so uh, I, I just kind of opened up my window in my office. I uh, had to go in one day for things that couldn't be avoided since it's a hardware company and sometimes you gotta be physically near the hardware for that. Um, and uh, I just kind of yelled at my window, like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> um, and it uh, turns out they're doing a structural evaluation study um, just to make sure that it's still structurally sound. Um, and you might recall that the city demanded one of those last year and was being fought in court. Uh, I'm told by the city that this is not the one that they asked for. Um, and then the construction workers also said, well, first off, they said it's not about to fall down on my head. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, and, and they said that what they were doing was work to support finishing the building in the relatively near future um, and not to tear it down. Uh, so it's very possible we might see some progress on there. Soon. So, so, so were those people on Dewberry's dime or the city's dime? Uh, so from my understanding, they must be on Dewberry's dime. Uh, so the city contracted with Kimley Horn, um, and they were from Nova Engineering. So it's not even the ones with the city contract. Um, you'd think if the city was willing to pay for it, he would just use that right. one. Right. Uh, but... I don't know. I guess it's the principle. Right. I think it's the principle with that guy. What do you, can I, this is, a, this is the toughest question I'm going to ask you here. And you are obviously very um, off the charts smart here. You're also a planning commissioner. What are your thoughts on what you've seen in Q1 and Q2, basically 2020, of how leadership has handled this pandemic? Oof. Uh, yeah, I mean... A pandemic is obviously a pretty difficult and unexpected thing that no one had planned for. Uh, so you got to give people some amount of leeway for the holy shit, the world is burning down around us. We're just trying to hold it together factor. Um, that said, you know, at this point, it's been it's been like, it's, isn't that the first months? 45 days where we give them that leeway? We're like, all right, they're figuring it out. It's been it's been a little bit. Yeah, um, and I mean, uh, it's been a little bit of a mixed performance. So, you know, at the very beginning, they were completely shut down. They were saying city council can meet in an emergency session, even well after the governor issued an executive order allowing other boards to meet. Um, they were saying, you know, the city communication staff uh, can't handle it. There's too much going on, um, which... You know, I may have made a snide comment at the time about how eight-year-olds can live stream on Twitch for eight hours a day with the picture-in-picture -picture inset. Um, but, uh, you know, no offense intended towards communication staff. But I will say they've really gotten their act together on the AV side. And uh, they're now broadcasting multiple meetings. Um, they've got slick graphics, uh, actually a countdown timer on public comment for three minutes, which makes it a lot easier to keep track of. Um, so, you know, they've really caught up and gotten it together. Um, that said, uh, you know, in other areas like the uh, the planning department, neighborhood development services still isn't accepting any new applications uh, because they haven't figured out or city council hasn't decided a way for uh, people to. There's supposed to be these meetings with the neighborhood uh, where typically, you know, one or two people show up. And sometimes when the neighborhood is really pissed off, but especially, you know, if there's a bunch of NIMBY sentiment, um, you'll get a lot of people there. Um, and actually, I think those meetings have an opportunity to be something very useful if it had broad engagement rather than just people who are directly upset and want to, and, and if you can solicit like positive, like productive feedback. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, they haven't figured out any way to do those meetings at all. So they're not accepting any applications into the city because technically an application isn't complete without that. What, what does that mean? What does that mean? Not accepting applications. Uh, so that means any any sort of like building project uh, that wasn't already in the pipeline uh, can't be initiated. You can't file for your permit. Is that is that residential and commercial? Uh, yeah. Um, so as of two days ago, 
now if it's completely by right, um, totally ministerial, now you can submit those, um, but you still can't submit anything that would like come before the planning commission, um, for example. So anything discretionary in any way, a rezoning, a special use permit, uh, you know, whatever. Um, and actually, speaking of which, uh, we've so we had our first planning commission meeting last week, um, which uh, actually, technically speaking, went off basically without a snag. I really thought everyone would be flailing around on Zoom, um, you know, myself included. I've never done a Zoom webinar, um, but uh, it actually went off pretty well, I think. Um, but uh we're, we had a meeting scheduled for July, um, and three city councilors had taken time in their schedule to attend that meeting, um, but it came up on Monday night only because the, the thing about ministerial applications got pulled from the consent agenda to talk about that whole issue of applications. Um, city council had never authorized any planning commission meetings be, beyond that very first one. Um, and city council's next meeting is canceled uh, because they always take a break in the first meeting in July. But this year, because the statute law is going to effect, they want to take action immediately to start the public comment period, et cetera. So they're taking off the last meeting in June, uh, which means there would never have been an opportunity to authorize this meeting that everyone was planning to happen. Um, mm. So that was a little odd. Um, and I mean, it really gets to the point of like, why not like every other jurisdiction in the Commonwealth just authorize meetings to happen? Um, and I, I get that there's there's definitely some worry that like in this new virtual Zoom world, yeah, it's not going to uh, be open to everybody. Yeah, but I mean, it's not really true no. that those old meetings in City yeah. Hall were open to everybody. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. If anything, the Zoom meetings are more ubiquitous and approachable. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I definitely think so. Uh, if you have kids and right. can't get the city hall on a Tuesday night, or like you have mobility issues, you're disabled, or you're just introverted, or you just don't want to sit in a freaking room for five hours, it's a no brainer. It's a no the internet. The internet is the great equalizer for community engagement. It's like the democratization of community engagement is the internet, guys. And I 100% agree with them. Let me get it. You you yeah. kill it in this setting. You're 25 minutes in here. Let me ask you this question here. You're killing it here. Um, I, I, try, I, res, I respect your th analysis. I don't always agree with it, but I, I, it, it gets me thinking. I respect it so much here. You talk about the applications not coming in, commercial and residential. We've had a hiatus for a little while here. Dude, we walk downtown all the time, and, and downtown is like a freaking ghost town right now. Um, tour, yeah. it's, tourism... <laughs> Tourism, um, restaurant, I mean, wh where are you, if you could give, give me a minute take on this here. Where are you on this economy for like the next 12 months? Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a difficult question. Um, you know, as you know, I'm an online food ordering guy. Uh, so that's picked up quite a bit for obvious reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, actually in the last week or two, especially weekends, these, these nice weekends, walking around the mall, it seems like it's really starting to fill up again. Um, and I think there really is, uh, you know, scientifically speaking, it's reasonable to believe that if you're outside, reasonably spaced from other people, wearing a mask when you're not at your table or talking directly with your house me household members, um, you're not really exposing yourself to much risk. Um, so I think there is a lot of opportunity um, for that sort of, uh, you know, getting out there in a safe way. Um, the problem, of course, is that, you know, that totally depends. If you're a restaurant owner in some restaurant location, uh, you might be blessed to have an enormous patio like Miller's or something um, and have plenty of room and like actually not that many people went inside, at least during the day before anyway, so it's probably fine. Um, or you can be like Sombreros, which just opened up right downstairs in my building. Um, definitely recommend you hit them up. Uh, but, you know, they're in that old New Dune spot um, or uh, Cardamom before that uh, in York Place. And they don't have any outdoor seating at all. Um, so, and, you know, obviously there's now a little bit of indoor seating allowed. So they've got like one table or maybe two that they can do inside. And then there's takeout traffic. Um, and of course, you know, a month ago, city council waived parking requirements so that restaurant owners can, if they're in a strip mall, they can turn their parking lot into, uh, you know, alfresco dining. 
um, which raises the question of why these business owners weren't allowed to decide how much parking versus al fresco dining they needed in the first place. I'll put that aside. Um, but if you're not in a strip mall, if you're somewhere like downtown and don't rent a bunch of underpriced patio space, um, you don't have anywhere to do you're that. You're screwed. Um, yeah, but like across the country, we're seeing all sorts of towns respond to this. And the very obvious solution in a world where we, our meter lot is half empty all the time, where the garages haven't seen a soul in months, um, where the you know privately owned credit card lot over there is also almost empty, like maybe take some of those on-street parking spots right there, turn them into tables where people can dine and be served. Um, you know, in a uh, place in the Northeast, we're seeing them take entire streets. Yeah. Uh, you know, just close off. I mean, like, look at what Stanton did. Stanton took their downtown for a weekend, yep. every weekend. Exactly. Yep. Um, so we really need to do that, I think, a lot more aggressively, uh, or we're going to see probably a lot more restaurants, uh, especially the ones that rely on dine-in traffic, um, go out of business. And dude, he, oh. and guys, he knows one of his businesses, his foodio business works with these guys. He has mm -hmm. his pulse like we do on this like industry. He knows you're a hundred percent right. Dude, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I, I could spend an hour. I could spend two days talking with you on this show here. You're just a wealth yeah. of knowledge. The city council, no -brainer, right? Like we don't lose anything by losing a couple on street parking spaces because there's so many of them wide open across. It's the a street. no brainer. It's a no brainer, but they're not doing anything. I, I think they, I think sky bar is not going to open. Red pump's not going to sky bar is not going to open until the end of the, the year in a different concept. Red pump tried to open for two weeks and then closed and said the hell with this. Um, we're, we're not sure about the downtown grills close. I mean, what do they need to happen before they actually do something? I don't know. Um, and I mean, you may have seen the story uh, that Nolan Stout reported where our traffic engineer sent in a memo, uh, a proposal on May 5th. Uh, so it's June 17th today. On May 5th, he sent a proposal in that said, hey, let's do like a week long trial, of some street closures so people can get out and exercise. Crickets, and no responses. Completely no brainer yeah. has gotten no response. No. And I just don't understand it. I, I honestly don't know. Right, right. Okay, so guys, this guy, an extremely intelligent person, I also, we do not understand it. I do not understand. Rory, I, I love when you come on this show, and so does everybody else that watches this program. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your time. Um, if you get any front page A1 above the fold stories, again, please let us know. Um, and thank you for keeping everybody on their toes, especially the police. We're grateful. Yeah, well, uh, I think I'm going to be sticking to Marie Bet for a little while, so I don't have to walk as far, and I don't end up in ridiculous situations like this one. Uh, sorry, Bodos, but um, it's just baguettes for me for a little while from now on. <laughs> you have a good one, Rory. Good job. Thank you. Rory Solzenborg, so good right there. That was just a great, great interview. I mean, okay, I'm going to dot the I's and cross the T's on this. Uh, let's, straight up, let's straight up say this here, okay? Okay. Um, Charlottesville, can you go on a one shot with me? Just a straight up one shot, please. Uh, Charlottesville City Hall. You should be responding to this issue with the Virginia State Troopers riding around in city maintenance and public works pickup trucks. Um, you should be responding to this in the next couple days just so this doesn't become an even more magnified story. It's just Optics 101. Optics 101. Um, man, we have so much content. I literally have so much content here that I'm going to try to get to here. All right, let's do this. Why don't we go to the CNBC headline about home buyer mortgage sentiment? Judah, if you could call that headline on screen. Check this out, and then I'm going to localize this um, story for you. So let me know when that's on screen, J-Dubs. Okay, that's on screen. Look at the screen now, guys. Home buyer demand for mortgages is at an 11-year high. I'm going to localize this for you really quickly, okay? Basically, this is the story in a nutshell. Interest rates are, are ridiculously low. If you get a, a conventional 30-year fixed and you're looking at something 500K or under, you're going to get an interest rate, if you have good credit, about 3.3%. That's like dirt cheap money, free money, 3.3%. We may never see interest rates like this again. So mortgage demand, 11-year high nationwide. Go back to me here, if you could. 
I've been saying this all along on this program. If you're thinking about selling your home, do it now because you have very little competition on the MLS and very little competition out there, so you'll have a lot of eyeballs on your product. If you're thinking about selling your home, do it now. Demand is up, and pent-up demand is certainly showing its head after quarantining throughout Q1 and Q2. So I'm going to localize this. Let's go to the West 2nd um, Street graphic, and let me know when that's on screen. Do you guys remember a few years ago when Keith Woodard was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with City Hall about a $50 million development called West 2nd? On Water Street, this $50 million development had 97 condos, a mixed-use development, was going to have retail in it, and it was going to be the home of the Charlottesville Farmers Market. $50 million development. Keith Woodard, a local developer, walked away from this project, leaving, depending on who you talk to, $1.2 to $1.8 million in underground infrastructure on the table. He said... I've spent $1.8 million here, but I'm going to walk away because dealing with City Hall and City Council is too frustrating. So he walked away. So I showed you a headline of home buyer mortgage demand spiking to an 11-year high. And then I followed that up with Keith Woodard's failed West 2nd Street project that was $50 million, had 97 luxury condominiums, was the home to the farmer's market and other retail. We... And by we, I mean City Hall at the time, did not have the vision and our foresight to green light this project. And the tax revenue that would have come from West 2nd would undoubtedly have helped us fill a budget deficit for NEC for 2021. So I encourage everyone that's in a position of leadership, whether Albemarle County, the city of Charlottesville, or any of the municipalities locally, to, to think big picture. Because right now we're trying to put a budget together for next year and we don't have enough money. And that $50 million project that Keith was trying to build on Water Street, that would have undoubtedly helped us right now from a real estate tax standpoint, from a retail uh, tax standpoint, and any other revenue that's associated with 97 condos and luxury. Okay, That creates a, a domino effect of revenue, taxable revenue, meals tax throughout the city. All right, and I'm going to close on this. Someone get the Sutton boys from Tiger Fuel watching the show. Someone get Tiger Fuel watching the show, please. We, we need to text, um, what is it, Taylor and uh, Dan Sutton. Tiger Fuel, one of these guys. Not Taylor. Um, all right. I want this to be a, Gordon Sutton, thank you. I want this to be a sizzle reel, guys. This is a real team. All right, so this is important. Gordon Sutton, Taylor Sutton, Tiger Fuel, family business. This is what the Board of Supervisors tonight are going to determine whether or not to give special use permit to Tiger Fuel. I have a crazy evening, or I would otherwise speak to the Board of Supervisors why I think it's a good idea. So what I'm going to do here, Gordon Sutton, Taylor Sutton, Tiger Fuel, and that team, is this is what I would say to the Board of Supervisors if I do not have time to sign up for today's meeting. Okay? Judah, the sizzle reel will start here. Thank you, Alamoro County Board of Supervisors, for allowing me to speak before you this evening. I'm speaking in favor of a special use permit for Tiger Fuel in the Keswick area, the Boyd Tavern exit, and the Black Cat Road corridor. The owner of this property has already told the Board of Supervisors and the Planning Commission in Albemarle County that he is going to sell this land one way or another. He said if we don't get Tiger Fuel and this Boyd Tavern market concept that they're trying to do off Black Cat Road, then he's going to find a big box brand like a Dollar General, and he's going to put, he's going to help, he's going to sell his property and help the big box brand go there. Would we in Keswick and in Albemarle County want a big box brand off the Boyd Tavern exit, or would we want a market that we know what to expect 
and their involvement in the community, and they're good stewards of Charlottesville. We have an opportunity now as residents to mold or shape through this special use permit application what we want from this site. And the Suttons and Tiger Fuel are willing to work with the county to make everyone happy or as happy as possible. They've already guaranteed 24 new jobs $100,000 a year in taxable revenue for Albemarle County if this special use permit is issued. They have said that this site will use less water than two combined houses. Think about that. They will use less water each day than two combined houses. Okay? People on Black Cat Road are raising a fuss, and they're saying, we can't have development here. And I feel your pain. But when you purchased a piece of property next to land that could be developed, developed for commercial use, you had this risk all along that commercial was going to be next to you in your neighborhood. So you can't cry now because you bought a place next to a potential development site. You can't cry and keep development from happening. By right, the land can be developed. By right for a big box brand that cares nothing about Keswick, Boy Tavern, Charlottesville, Albemarle County. They can do that by right without a special use application, a special use permit. So Black Hat Road, wake up and get a freaking grip. Let's be adults and let's Put a freaking business in there that is tied to Charlottesville that has decades and generations of community stewardship behind it as opposed to some bogus dollar store that can go out there that doesn't give a rat's you know what about you and I. Wake up. You bought property next to a piece of land that can be developed. Your crying is not going to keep the development from happening. Wake up. A hundred jobs excuse me, 24 jobs, 100000 a year in taxable revenue for Albemarle County, and a family that lives in the community that's committed to making this site local and efficient and smart and what the community wants, that's a hell of a lot better than some big box brand when you go in there about trash in the backyard, trash in the parking lot at a Dollar General, and you go in there and you talk to the manager, Susie Q. Do you think Susie Q has any autonomy of what to do there? Hells to the no. So, Board of Supervisors, your job is to have vision and to lead, and your job is not to make everybody happy, and sometimes you have to pick the best of two evils. And Black Cat Road and its residents are the vocal haters for this project. And from their standpoint, they say evil is development. Well, supervisors, if they say evil is development, pick the best of the two options. And the best one is a market that we've seen, how many iterations of it? Ivy, Fifth Street, Cherry Avenue, Green County. Good Lord. This is a freaking no-brainer. This is a no-brainer. I'm Jerry Miller. It's the I Love Seville Show, guys. Have a good afternoon.